at home with ABOR's housing economist, Claire Losey. Hey, everyone. We are back with another weekly Driving at Home housing forecast with our very own Dr. Claire Losey. Hey there, Claire. Thanks for joining us. Hey, Kalea. Thanks for having me. As you can hear, I am not Emily Chenevere. I am Kalea Youngblood, ABOR's Chief Marketing Officer, filling in for Emily today. And I'm excited to jump in with you and hear all about what we what we can expect this week. But first, there was this little headline that came out on June 30th um, that I thought we could kick off our talk today talking about this national headline where the Supreme Court rejected the Biden administration's student loan forgiveness plan, which would have canceled over $400 billion in debt held by tens of millions of borrowers. So, Dr. Losey, why don't you kick us off and tell us a little bit more about that and how it might affect first-time homebuyers? Absolutely. And just as an aside, of course, this is not a political commentary in any way, shape, or means. It's just commentary on how it will affect potential home buyers. So broadly speaking, the way the proposed plan would have worked, it would have administered $10,000 in student loan forgiveness to households earning up to $125,000 or up to, or excuse me, individuals earning up to $125,000 or households earning up to $250,000. And then for low-income families who had received Pell Grants, there would have been an additional $10,000 in student loan forgiveness for a total of $20,000. In essence, student loan debt remains one of the primary constraints to homeownership among first-time and lower-income homebuyers. So overall, it, the resumption of the student loan payments in October is going to generally extend the time for potential borrowers, potential home buyers, to save for a down payment on a home. And it's also going to increase their debt to income ratio. And of course, we all know that there are certain maximum debt to income ratios beyond which a lender will not award a loan to any individual borrower. So those are the two primary implications for student loan borrowers moving forward. Mm -hmm. So just something else for agents to know and sort of be aware of when they're working with a client that has some um, student loan barriers um, and limitations there to see you got some um, down payment resource opportunities, et cetera, that's outside of this um, potential or what was a potential opportunity. So with that said, um, just getting that out of the way, we want to transfer, uh, transition into what's going on locally. This week, we do have our monthly market stats. Uh, those will be going out on Thursday. So let's, um, let's talk about what's happening here in Central Texas in our marketplace. Give us a little teaser on what we can expect going out this month as we launch these market stats for, for this month. So overall, the June housing market remained relatively robust, especially given the uptick in mortgage rates that we saw last month. So mortgage rates averaged about 6.7-ish percent in June versus about 6.4% in May. But overall, again, the Austin housing market remained relatively robust. We actually saw an uptick on a month-over-month basis in the median sales price of about 3%. So a modest uptick, but certainly, you know, certainly an interesting one, again, given the increase in interest rates. And it's the first we've seen since January of this year. So overall, the housing market performed relatively well. We're seeing more of a balance between the supply of homes for sale and the demand for those homes. So it seems like the market is adjusting more so to, um, you know, our post-pandemic conditions and higher mortgage rates. Yeah, and we'll certainly dissect this more deeply next week. Um, But when we're just talking about market stats as a whole, uh, it's a lot of information We get a lot of people that are using our resources and sharing it out on their social platforms and trying to sort of understand what's happening. What would you say are some things you definitely should be looking for within our market stats to tell your clients? Like what are the top three things that when we publish this, all this data, what should they be looking for first and foremost and and relaying to their clients? Sure. So a couple of factors 
And the first two relate back to what I was just talking about. And that's just overall, we're seeing a more balanced market. Again, the supply of homes for, for sale is becoming more in line with the ensuing demand for those homes. So that means that there are more options available in the market for buyers. And, um, you know, they probably aren't going to face as much pricing pressure as they did, you know, in 2021, 2022, when, when the market was really at its pandemic heights. So overall, you know, just, just more balance in the market. And then the second factor is just that Although mortgage rates have ticked upward and they're at sustained highs relative to June of last year, actually, affordability has eased slightly. So last year, the mortgage rate averaged about 5.5% in June. This year, again, it hovered around about 6.7% in June. So despite that, you know, over one percentage point increase in mortgage rates, um, the decline in home purchasing power that ensued from that rise in mortgage rates was more than offset by the year-over-year decline in the median sales price. So we saw slight ease in affordability on that front. But overall, of course, you know, affordability remains one of our um, you know, key topics here at ABOR and just across the broader Austin market, we are all, you know, of course, very plugged into and aware of of affordability constraints, especially for those lower income and first time buyers, but showing some hopeful signs again with that slight ease and affordability. And then lastly, I would say that listings have remained relatively unchanged. And while that may initially sound um you know, sound kind of dubious, really what it's telling us is that sellers are not responding in a particularly negative fashion to the to higher interest rates, right? You know, they're not they're not pulling back to the extent that we may have otherwise expected, given, you know, the precipitous increase in mortgage rates that we observed over 2022 and that has continued, you know, to be an issue in in 2023. So sellers are still willing to work within the conditions of the current housing market. And, you know, that's, again, certainly welcome news, of course, to buyers who now have more options at their disposal. Yeah, they have some leverage. That's great. And then also, you know, just the headline is we need housing and we need housing for all when it comes to affordability. So um, thank you for that. One, um, one other twist on this is the rental market. And I know we like to talk about the rental market in the, in the context of all of this. And we saw that um, your year over year growth in rental rates are declining. Can you give us some more details on that? Absolutely. So overall, rental rates in Austin remain relatively robust, just given that we're such a high growth area, both with respect to our population and employment base. But we have seen some easing in that rate of growth. So again, not a not a decline in the rental rates themselves per se, but a decline in their rate of growth. And this is really, you know, certainly welcome news for potential buyers, especially those potential first-time buyers. As that growth in rental rates declines, it allows them more of a cushion to save for their down payment, you know, more disposable income to put towards the purchase of their first home. So overall, this is good news for the homeownership front. And of course, for runners, just in general, as inflation continues to be a key concern. Of course, within the rental market, um, you know, there's more exposure to inflationary pressures than if you're a homeowner. Generally, if you're a homeowner, you have a fixed rate mortgage. So you're more or less protected. You know, you have fixed mortgage payments every month. So you're more or less protected from those inflationary pressures on a housing, um, you know, at least on the housing front. But of course, if you're a renter, your rent is going to increase annually commensurate with the increase in inflation. So, And then just a follow-up question to that, what's going on with single family versus apartment rentals in relation to um, these rental rates, year over year rental rates? 
That's a great question. So overall, we've seen a little bit more resilience within the single family rental market than we have, say, in the apartment market. And that's largely because when we think of substitutes, right, for purchasing a home, the first comparable alternative to buying a home is going to be renting a single family home. So, you know, potential buyers on the margin who may not have been able to step into the market for home ownership yet, you know, due to higher rates or due to higher inflation, which has eroded their ability to save for the down payment, et cetera, they're going to be more likely to seek a single family rental than they are an apartment. So that's allowed some resiliency in the robustness of the single family rental market relative to the apartment market. Gotcha. Well, thank you for that. That was a good rundown. I want to transition now finally to week over week stats. What's going on locally? Um, what are we looking um, looking at on a week by week basis? And what can we expect to see this week? Great question. So overall, last week, housing activity declined on a week over week basis just due to the July 4th holiday. Of course, we lost one full business day last Tuesday, and then lots of folks were out on vacation, you know, that Monday, July 3rd, and and maybe even longer. So residential sales were down nearly 50%. 15? 50%. In the MSA, while pending sales dropped nearly 23%. And then active and new listings for homes for sale declined 8% and 22% respectively. With respect to residential leasing activity, we also saw a decline, but to a lesser extent than that of residential sales. Closed leases were down 32%, while pending leases declined about 16%. And then active listings for homes for lease ticked down 16%, but new listing for new listings for homes for lease rose about 7%. Of course, Leases are a little bit easier to sign than, you know, it's a little bit easier to to get um, that going than it is to close on a home. So there's there's less barriers there. But overall, you know, next week we should see a slight uptick. It's probably going to continue to lag a little bit, just what with pending sales and pending leases being down because, again, of that July 4th holiday. So moving forward, we'll start to see activity took up a little bit on a week over week basis but of course with you know summer at full force and folks on vacation there's just going to be you know continued volatility on that front yeah some ebb and flow there okay well um i think that's all for this week dr losi thank you so much for your insight we went from national to local to down to rental and weekly stats so just a reminder for all of our listeners if you have any questions or thoughts about our weekly podcast or you want us to touch on something specific, please email us at communications at abor.com. And then also don't forget, quick plug, on July 26th is our annual Central Texas Housing Summit, both live and in, uh, in person and virtually. So if you purchase a ticket, you'll also get a recording. You can tune in virtually or come visit us live at our headquarters. Get your tickets at abor.com. It's going to sell out, so please don't wait. And we look forward to seeing you there. Uh, Dr. Losey, again, thanks so much. And we'll hear from you again next week. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. Take care.